Hi, my name is Tony McLaughlin from Citibank Transaction Services, and today we are talking payments with Michael Salmoni. Michael, great uh, to see you. Would you uh, just start by telling us, uh, you know, who you are, what you do, and uh, what you're interested in at the moment? Sure. Uh, my name is Salmoni. I'm Executive Advisor to the Board at uh, Equins Worldline, which is currently the largest payments uh, provider in Europe. And after our hopefully upcoming merger with Ingenico, we will be the fourth largest in the world. So we have a very big interest in payments, especially in Europe and increasingly globally. Yeah, absolutely. You seem to be very acquisitive uh, these days. You've snapped up some relatively big players. Well, that's the name of the game now. Uh, payments is very much a scale business. And uh, 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 so it's, it's good to be able to, to, to leverage that. So what, what are the topics on your mind at the moment um, in the European payments landscape and wider? Um, how, how do you see those payments landscape emerging as a result of the crisis? Well, there are the sort of uh, uh, obvious ones not necessarily related to payments, that just digitization is getting a big boost right now. Right? We see yeah. that, that we're meeting everybody with Zoom or we have to work out which of the 17 different online meeting platforms we, we should be using. So there's obviously a need for consolidation uh, uh, there. But regarding um, uh, payments and uh, digitization, it is an absolute joy to see, for example, that some topics which have been absolutely impossible to move, for example, uh, less cash in Germany, just to take one example, yeah. is now seems to be really possible, right? We've had an, an enormous jump in contactless payments in, in Germany. So uh, we can see that in terms of crisis and uh, that modern technology sometimes get a huge push. Absolutely. The limit, uh, the limit in the UK just was increased from 30 pounds to 45 pounds. Is similar things are happening on the continent? Well, absolutely. You, uh, you may have seen that the EPC did a survey across the whole of Europe. And in fact, almost every country is, is doubling the, the limits. And uh, I think we're quite fortunate in Europe because we have a very good infrastructure here. And we're also uh, sort of culturally, uh, I think, uh, quite in tune with uh, digitization. And there, but there are some surprising uh, differences. For example, at the moment, I'm quite involved with Japan, uh, who always appear as a very uh, technologically advanced nation, which, of course, uh, they are by and large. But they're one of the cash heaviest nations in the world. They're even three Indeed. times more cash reliant than Germany. And one of the things that they're now encountering is, is more a, a cultural problem. Uh, to do with signatures uh, because they are used to putting stamps on pieces of paper. A yeah. hanko, it's called. And so since when you're sitting in remote offices connected via Zoom, you cannot uh, co-sign a, a, a contract using hanko stamps anymore. So they see the need for digitization in uh, digital identity, for example, coming in through that rather curious route. Absolutely. So I get there, there is this, I guess, commentary about what the crisis will uh, lead to is is more digital, uh, more digital everything. But of course, there are viruses in the digital world as well, not just in the uh, in the physical world. So, I just wonder whether or not we will build new vulnerabilities by dashing to digital um, as a result of the crisis. I mean, it certainly exposes us to a risk which I think is already part of of our world, and that's cybercrime even more. And there are some people who say the next crisis, not the previous one, which was the financial crisis, nor this one, the virus one, but the next one will actually be due to cybercrime because the mm -hmm. hackers have got so sophisticated and talk to each other and cooperate so intelligently, which we don't always do in the financial services industry. We need to cooperate much better to defend against this, that maybe one of the next causes of a uh, financial crisis may actually be cybercrime. And the more we go digital, and the more gaps we have, for example, not proper doing identity properly, uh, et cetera, will cause a lot of problems. Well, I, I wanted to go back to what you said about the, uh, you know, the smaller businesses becoming digital. I know that in, in Germany, for example, there are you know, many restaurants that only accept cash. So there'll be many thousands of businesses that need to get online and accept uh, electronic payments, both face-to-face ultimately through contactless payments and also online. Uh, your company is a massive player in that, in that space. So are you seeing uh, that kind of influx of demand? Uh, do you have 
you know, programs in place to help smaller businesses accept payments? I think there's, there's a huge slew of programs, not, no, not only from our company, but from, from the government, from the regulators, to try and accelerate the, the move to digitization. We don't want to be so dependent on physical location where people are, physical things like, like, uh, like cash, etc. So, so I, I, I do see a huge move. But it's not only in the retail space, I think also in the B2B space, which I always think we talk far too little about in, in the payment yeah. area. Um, you know, how do you uh, uh, fully electronify and distribute uh, uh, those processes? For example, if you have multiple people who need to sign off on, the, on, on a treasury uh, uh, release of the salary payments for, for a huge corporate, you know, how do you do that when people are sitting in home offices, maybe in not very secure environments without any uh, chip card readers? And so how do you do multi-signatory processes or how do you do e-treasury uh, uh, when people are working from home. I think these are going to be the real challenges now, not only the retail, but how to actually transform the whole of the businesses. So really uh, reimagining these workflows and enabling them to cope with uh, remote working and, and digital signing, essentially. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. A banker I was talking to recently was saying, you know, we've, uh, we're used to having about a thousand people in home office and that's fine, we can manage that well. What does a bank look like when we have 100,000 people in home office? <laughs> maybe for a long time. And, you know, maybe they're connected via some slightly dodgy uh, broadband uh, in some remote village and they don't have the security they have at home. They don't have a Bloomberg terminal at home either. How can they continue to, doing, to do their work? And I think that, is, that raises some really interesting questions, yeah. which goes way beyond us just connecting via Zoom instead of all jumping on the plane all the time. Yeah. No, no, no. I'm intrigued by this notion of things that people talked about for ages that crises uh, actually bring into actuality. Um, and it's, it's in particular in the European context, uh, you know, what, what do you think will the crisis bring into the world that's been talked about for a long time? Is this going to... Um, you know, create European Central Bank digital currency, uh, uh, this European payments initiative to have a European scheme, uh, maybe a pan-European federated ID uh, initiatives. What's, what's going to accelerate and actually happen, come out of the talking shops and get into reality as a result of the crisis? I mean, I'm not so sure whether the, to just to pick up at the topics that you mentioned, whether the CBDC will get an acceleration. I think that's driven by other factors, quite honestly. Mm. And uh, I think all the questions that are raised with that, you know, will that cause a bank run? And what, why, what will happen to commercial banks if central banks start issuing their own money? I think those are the, 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 the main pre questions which are probably not impacted that much by, by COVID, I would have said. However, the idea that... Uh, we in Europe need a pan-European scheme, I think is, after all, uh, is, is still a very good idea. And we're also seeing in PSD2 and open banking where Europe leads the world, after all. I mean, that was, that's kind of nice. Usually we import things from California or from China, so it's kind of nice to have something where the Europeans are really good at, which they could then maybe export to others. So, so an open banking scheme, which doesn't just consist of plonking an API there, and, uh, and, but actually covering the whole of the problem space, like how do you manage disputes and how do you manage fraud and how do you do Indeed. branding, all the things there. So a, a European scheme is, is surely uh, still very important. And another thing that Europe, I think, may be leading the world is privacy. And that, to me, is another really key thing that is getting a lot of attention, rightly, during the crisis. You know, we're starting to do apps which are tracking us, which might help monitor who's talking to who. And uh, some have some concerns about the privacy implications of that. So I think it's really good that people are thinking more about privacy and maybe Europe, with its uh, leading role, there can help. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, remarkable that in this context, the privacy concerns are so much uh, in, in the forefront of the discussion. Whereas uh, you could argue that from a public health perspective, a bit, a bit more of a draconian approach would be justified just to keep people safe and alive. Um, so yeah, I think, you, I, I think you're right. Europe through GDPR certainly has raised the awareness of uh, the need for informed consent. Yes. 
Yes. I would actually see some of that a little bit the other way around, quite honestly. I mean, maybe I've lived in Germany for too long, but people are very sensitive to privacy here, right? Extremely sensitive. I think it's one of the yeah. few countries which basically didn't allow Google Street View and things, right? So because people are very, very sensitive about privacy. And all of a sudden we have this COVID app where all sorts of data is now being gathered and people seem to be quite relaxed about it and think it's a good idea. So it's, it's amazing how when you see the usefulness of something and the utility that you uh, sometimes get a really quick mindset change, which causes much more difficult than just a technology change or a business set. Uh, business, uh, uh, how do you get a, a mindset and a culture change going? Yeah. That's why the crisis, I think, is, uh, has been uh, really accelerating and helpful. Yeah, I guess it's changed behaviours on a whole spectrum of human activity. And um, it's remarkable how quickly people kind of adapt to this. I, I hate this phrase, new normal. I don't, I don't think it's new and I don't think it's, nor <laughs> it's normal. But hmm. we're that, an adaptable species. And um, yeah, we're adopting things that uh, you know we're we're so we're so far kind of niche interests are becoming uh, very very widespread. But I also did want to ask you. Uh, Sorry, I was just wondering what, what also what you were thinking. What what are going to be the sort of temporary changes, and what are going to be the lasting ones? Right. I mean, for example, is this yeah. that we tr hardly travel anymore? We we do everything by Zoom, and it seems to work quite well. Will that be a new normal? And we will genuinely sort of reduce 90% of our business travel or will that go away? Uh, I think some of those, the, the answers aren't clear yet. Huh? They're, not, they're not clear yet, but I, I do also think that um, we can bounce in both directions fairly, fairly quickly. Uh, you know, needs, when needs must, we can stay at home for, for a few months. Yes. And then once the shackles are released, We'll be back on the on the planes again and uh, on the on the beaches in Mallorca. Um, so I think we'll flip fairly fairly rapidly when circumstances change. I certainly can't um, wait to go to the pub again. <laughs> Absolutely, I'll join you. I'll join you there. And in fact, that's a, another thing I wanted to ask you in terms of how your lifestyle is at the moment. That when when things go back to an in inverted commas normal. Um, what will be the thing that you would like to maintain from your current lifestyle rather than just go back to the old way? I mean, this uh, less traveling is certainly something. I've been a very intensive traveler and I've always been, quite honestly, a little bit skeptical of these video conferences and they are not as good as meeting somebody face to face. But now that everybody's become so used to it and the technology's become so mature that it almost works really well, the sound quality is good, the video works instantly. You still can't quite see the nuances of people's faces, especially if there's several people around the table. But that's something I would really like, uh, like us to keep, right? Not only for the environment yeah. and for, for our personal well-being. I think that's, that's really great. And of course, if sort of contactless uh, shoots up more, we use more digital payments. Maybe we start using digital identity and identifying e each other more reliably. If these things get a big push, if we get a pan-European scheme going, if all these things happen, so, so be it. Excellent. Yeah. Well, Michael, it's been delightful to talk to you. And I'll see you in the pub after the crisis is finished. It's Thank a date. Thank you very much. It's a date. Pleasure talking to you, Tony. You too. Bye-bye. All the best. Bye-bye.